This is our second assignment using multi-frame to explore the effects of beam continuity over interior supports. In this assignment, <clears throat> we're going to use beam continuity over interior supports to minimize beam cross sections. In the previous assignment, we used beam continuity as a way of minimizing deflection. In this case, we're going to look at optimizing beam cross sections for bending strength. You're going to open up a blank file in multiframe and save it off, or rather save it under the name, your last name, first name, beam continuity using multiframe dash two for assignment two. We're gonna work in a frontal view. So we generally like to look at things um, in this view. However, we're going to stay in the 3D view, but rotate the view so that we're looking straight on. And the reason we're going to do this is that we want to render this so we have a sense of what the proportions are. And we can render in this view, but we cannot render in this front view. In other words, you can render in the 3D view. So we have basically <clears throat> rotated the view around so that even though we're in the 3D view, we're also in the frontal view. We're going to set up three continuous beams over two interior supports. And then we're going to proceed to modify some of them. So we're going to go to this icon, which is generate a continuous beam. We're going to say we want three segments or spans, and we're going to make each of those 30 feet. So we'll type in 30 for each of these links. The overall span of the entire beam will be 90 feet. And we're going to have pin joints on the interior and pin joints on the end. And then we're going to click OK. Now, I would like to center this because it makes certain operations easier. So I'm zooming out. I'm highlighting all of that. I'm now going to move it minus 45 degrees. Excuse me, 45 feet in the X direction. So it's now centered and now I'm going to hit Control T, which is for control total, meaning uh, fill the image with, or the uh, frame with the image of this beam. Now I'm going to highlight all of this, and I'm going to duplicate. So I go up to geometry, and I'm sorry that duplicate is slightly off of your screen, but it's in this menu down below. And I'm going to push it up. 10 feet in the y direction and i'm going to duplicate it twice and now to center and everything i'm going to hit control total again so now i have three beams all of which are identical so far now i know that i can't analyze these three beams yet because multi-frame insists that everything be connected in some way so I'm going to play my usual game. I create a connected beam that goes from there to there, and then from there to there, and I'll hit escape to stop that. And now this little fictitious beam, I just want to make it a, a minimal thing. So I'm going to go to the sections library, and I'm going to pick pipe, and it comes up with a half inch pipe, and I'm going to say, okay, and then I want to make sure, even though <clears throat> that's a half inch pipe and it has very little stiffness and very little strength, I want it to have zero influence on those beams. So I'm now going to come up to frame and do member releases 
and then I'm going to click here to release the end moments, MZ and MY, which assures that those little tiny beams have no influence in resisting any rotation at the ends of the other beams. All these other beams, I'm going to go in, I'm going to make them something like the following, a W10, um, by 26 and now as I mentioned I can see those um, rendered so I can see what the proportions are now a W10 by 26 is a very shallow beam for spanning 30 feet but you'll see shortly why we might want to do that um, typically we use continuity anytime we're trying to reduce deflection and so that means anytime we want to have a shallow beam, we'd like to make it continuous. So for the moment, we're going to pick a fairly shallow beam and see how it works. Now I'm going to go to my load case. <clears throat> and again, I'm going to go to the frontal view, except in this case, I don't have to uh, do a 3D view uh, because I don't need to render anything in this view. So here is my frontal view. And by the way, right at the moment, I guess I did something with this file a while ago. So I'm going to go to display symbols and you'll notice you can turn on section names and that normally is not the case. But in the case of this particular problem, I'm going to be interested in knowing that uh, at some point. And so we'll come back to that issue of what are the various things you can display and when do you want to go about doing that but for the time being i want to take these three beams and i'm just going to throw a load on here i'm going to say global distributed load and it comes up as one kip per foot and the default direction is downward <clears throat> the presumption here is that lacking any other evidence they're going to assume you want it to be gravity loaded so i'm going to click ok and now if I want verification that that's one kip per foot, I can turn on these numbers or I can turn them off. So I'm going to save this file because I just want to do that periodically. And now I'm going to come up and I'm going to say analyze linear. And now I'm going to go to the plot window. And again, I'm going to go to the frontal view and I'm going to hit control total to get everything within the frame and uh, centered. Now, I'm looking at moment right here, but I'm actually interested in bending stress from a point of view of sizing these beams. So, all of these are continuous, but I want to compare that to simple span. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to take all of these members and I'm going to go to frame member releases and I'm going to turn off the strong axis bending, meaning every one of those are coming to the joint and they're not interacting with any other beams that are coming to that joint or any other members. So I'll click OK and now I'm going to go through analysis and it's going to come back and give me this message that the structure has unrestrained degrees of freedom. Sometimes I can click OK and then I can say, do you want to continue the analysis? And I'll say yes. And it comes back and says the solution does not make sense. It doesn't always say that, but I'm going to click OK. So here's what the software is concerned about. Um, it's got a bunch of members that are coming to joints like this and the end releases are all applied and then this is a pin joint on top of that and now the software is beginning to get nervous that we don't know what we're doing and it wants us to constrain things a bit more so I'm going to come along here I'm going to pick all of these joints I selected the members but also I selected the joints and I'm going to put fixed restraint. Now, in our minds, that doesn't make any difference 
but the software needs that in order to complete its analysis. So I'm going to choose fixed, but keep in mind that nothing is fixed here because every one of these members is end released. We know that from these little circles here that tell us that the member end uh, joints are relaxed or there's nothing restraining them at that point. So they have some kind of clip angle connection or something that just doesn't create any moment at all. So we, I think we've satisfied the computer that maybe we know what we're talking about. And when I go hit analysis linear, it does the analysis. And now when I go here, you'll notice that um, I now have the classic moment curve for a simple span beam, which is repeated for each of these three sections. So I've end released it. I have a simple span beam. These two beams, on the other hand, are continuous over these interior supports. So they're continually exhibiting a negative moment. Now, I'm going to keep one of these as it is, and I'm going to keep this as it is. Those are two base cases. And then I'm going to go play with this third case to see what sort of interesting things I can do. So uh, one of the things that I note is that this negative moment is larger than that positive moment. I also note that this moment is very small and therefore not very interesting. And in fact, there's something disturbing about having 38 kips per square inch or 38.7 kips per square inch in this negative bending stress, and then this positive bending stress is only 9.67 kips per square inch. So I'd like to do something with this bottom beam that's a little bit imaginative that will maybe enhance the way the beam's performing. But actually, before that, let me, let me observe one other thing. We had 48.4 kips per per square inch in compression on the compression side of this beam. And by the way, if we picked the tension side, we'd also have 48.4 kips per square inch. It's just right now we are exhibiting the, the stress, the bending stress on the compression face, which in the case of a simple span beam is on the top of that beam. This beam is 48.4 kips per square inch. This material can only stand 50 kips per square inch, or at least that's what we're going to assume, that that's the grade we're working with, because that's the most common grade for any kind of wide flange beam. And we're going to pick a wide flange beam to do uh, this beam study, because that's the most common beam that we will use in steel. So the section that I picked was already preconceived to give you the right stress. If this was over 50, it would be overstressed. If it was substantially less than 50, the beam would be over-designed. But it's 48.4, and it's hard to get closer than that um, in terms of a very efficient beam that is getting the job done, but is not over-designed or oversized. So we're not going to do anything with that particular beam, but we are going to come back to this one because we're observing that it's 38.7 is the maximum bending stress, which is occurring, by the way, in this case on the tension side. All of these, by the way, are on the top of the beam. In this location right here, the top of the beam is actually in tension. So it's showing this stress uh, with a T after it, meaning that this is a tension stress associated with the bending moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to here and we're going to say let's take all of these beams and let's pick a smaller size. So we're going to go pick a W10 by 22 and we're going to say okay. Then we're going to analyze linear again and then we're going to come to our bending stress. 
and we see that now on the negative side here, we're getting a bending stress of 46.5. Now, if we stick with a 10 inch deep beam, we can't possibly do any better than that because the next smaller size is going to drive the stress way up above 50 kips per square inch. So we're going to say that particular beam is sized correctly. So now we finally are going to go deal with our third beam situation here. And we're going to ask ourselves, what can we do to make this a better, more efficient beam configuration? So one of the things we'd observe is that this span right here is pretty short and is resulting in a very low stress. On the other hand, the control stress in this case is this negative moment, which is controlled in the end by the length of this cantilever. So we're going to go in and we're going to rearrange the configuration of this beam to see if we can shorten this cantilever and thereby reduce this bending stress. But we don't want to shorten the cantilever so much that this goes too high because if we shorten that cantilever to zero we would essentially have this situation and we don't want that. We like to actually make these two about equal in magnitude. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to come here and we're going to pick this and we're going to say break. And, and by the way, I, I could be more careful about this, but I'm not going to do this. I'm going to just bore right in and I'm going to say make this length uh, eight feet and this length eight feet and I'm going to divide it into three parts and I get that. And then I'm going to take all of this because I want to control various parts of this and I'm going to go up here to group and I'm going to say remove design beam because I want each of these sections to be individually controllable. And now I'm going to come here and I'm going to analyze again. And so now nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. And the reason is that I wanted to release this beam and I didn't do it when I was here. So I'm going to go to frame member releases and I'm going to relax the moment about the z-axis. So now I have a simple span beam between those two points. And now I'm going to go analyze again. And I'll come here. And now this is a little higher and that's a little lower. And that's a little higher. So all this is trending in the direction that I wanted to. But I pretty much just broke that beam in a way that was semi-intuitive, but there was no logic to it. I just broke it into three parts and I made these individual cantilevers. That one there and this one here, I made the same length. So now I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say clearly because this negative moment is bigger than that positive moment, I want to reduce this cantilever because the cantilever is what's producing. It is totally responsible for producing this negative moment right here. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to go there and I'm going to ask myself, what's the coordinates of that point? And I'm going to just say, I want to make it minus eight because by moving it further away from zero, and by the way, this is part of the reason that I wanted to center all those beams about the central um, coordinate system here, or the, the origin of the coordinate system, is that it makes certain things easy for me. So this dimension right here was seven, and I made it eight. In other words, I took it from x equals minus seven to x equals minus 8. And in the process, I reduced the length of this cantilever. And that cantilever is now 7 feet. And I want to come over here and I want to do the same thing. And so I'm going to make this 
8. So now this is minus 8 plus 8, so I've increased the length of the beam from 14 feet to 16 feet, and I've reduced these cantilevers from 8 feet to 7 feet. And now I'm going to go analyze linear, and I'll look at my bending stress. And now I'm getting in the ballpark. So this negative bending moment is producing a bending stress of 35, 34.6 kips per square inch. I've got 32.6 up here. So I'm very close to having this and that balanced. So I've been jacking this one up, reducing this one. I'm trying to get them about equal. So I'm going to just go in here and I'm going to guess a number. And I'm going to make this minus 8.4. And make this plus 8.4. So the overall simple span beam from there to there is 16.8 feet. And each of these cantilevers now is 6.6 .6 feet. And now I'm going to analyze that. And I'm going to go back to my plot window. And now I'm about as close as I'm going to get without a lot of torture. Uh, this is 33.16, and this negative moment is 33.207. So you'll notice in going from simple span to continuous, I have the same, I have uh, comparable bending stress between there and there, but remember, this beam is a 10 by 26. This is a 10 by 22. Now I'm about to reduce this one down in magnitude also. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to say that beam is now over-designed because of all these cool things that I've done to um, adjust the nature of the continuity effects that are going on. And now I'm going to change this to a W10 by 19. Now I'm going to go back and analyze and go to my plot window and now look how beautifully balanced everything is. We have a, a tension on the top surface of 49.3 kips per square inch, uh, compression on the top surface of 49.21. Those are almost perfectly balanced. And now the only thing that needs to be changed in our system here is this does not have to be the same section as prevails over that length and over that length because clearly this little section right here is over designed. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to take a wild guess at what this ought to be and I'm going to just zoom down to a W10 by 12 and now I'll go analyze again and now when I come to this plot window I've got 38.83 kips per square inch in that simple span zone. Now I could reduce that even further to a W8 by something or other <clears throat> And I might save some weight, but I actually tend to doubt it because by the time we jump down to an 8, we may end up needing a heavier section. But nonetheless, we're going to quit here. So what I'm going to ask you to do is the following. I'm going to ask you to come here and turn on display symbols and then put section names like so. So you're going to show that diagram. Then you're going to show a diagram, which you're going to snag, by the way, or snip. So in doing this, by the way, what you probably want to do is 
come along and use your snipping tool. So I'm going to pick that right now. And I'm going to surround all of this. And then I'll go save that. And you probably can't see some of this. But um, we're going to save that as the frame image. And I'm not going to do all of this because... Sorry, I've wandered off the image. Then you're going to come along, you're going to render it. It's going to look like that. You'll snag that image or snip that image. You're then going to come and snip this image. And then you're going to snip that image. And you're going to paste all of those either into a Word document or a PowerPoint document. And you're going to submit that document and your multi-frame file. So remember, it's going to be your last name first, then your first name, then beam continuity using multi-frame dash two. And you will submit those two files as an upload to complete this assignment. So that completes our step-by-step -step follow along process for setting up and executing this assignment, addressing the use of beam continuity over interior supports to minimize beam cross-sections.